side chain reactions of benzene is going to be the topic of this lesson. And in the last lesson, we went through reduction of the pi electrons in the benzene ring itself. But in this one, we're going to focus on things that are attached, substituents attached to the benzene ring. And we'll talk about side chain oxidations and side chain reductions for different substituents. We'll also take a look and remind ourselves about benzylic bromination and putting a good leaving, leaving group on that benzylic carbon and what that opens up for us. Now this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. Okay, before we dive into side chain oxidation, which is where we're gonna start here, I just wanna remind you of the oxidation of primary alcohol. So if I've got a lovely primary alcohol here, we learned that with chromic acid or PCC, uh, we could oxidize it. Now PCC might stop at the aldehyde, but we learned with chromic acid. So, and one way to represent chromic acid was sodium or potassium dichromate with sulfuric acid. So, and we would oxidize this two steps and go right past the aldehyde all the way to a carboxylic acid. So you wouldn't be able to isolate the aldehyde intermediate that's halfway there. So two steps of oxidation all the way to a carboxylic acid. Now what we didn't necessarily teach you, and in some classes you might learn this, so, so but that an alternative to chromic acid is actually potassium permanganate. And I didn't cover it then. So, and most textbooks actually kind of omit it and it's just an extra reaction, but it works, you know, just fine if you use potassium permanganate instead of chromic acid. Now, that's relevant here because often in this case, we often teach you one or the other or both depending on the textbook, but it's much more common to show up not just chromic acid, so for side chain oxidation, but also the permanganate reaction as well. And so you might see either one of these or in your particular class, you might be on the hook for both. Now, the way this works, you wanna focus on your benzylic carbon. So uh, mechanism for this is not gonna be important, but when this happens and how exactly it happens and what's the result, uh, in your products, that's going to be important. So focus on your benzylic carbon in every single case. And so that's going to be the, the, the carbon of interest. And if you recall with our, so primary alcohol, so it's the alcohol carbon that we focused on. And as if it, since it has two hydrogens, that's why it was capable of two steps of oxidation to a carboxylic acid. If we had a secondary alcohol, it only have one hydrogen, be capable of one step. But we also learned that if you've got a tertiary alcohol, that no reaction was going to happen with the carbon attached to the hydroxyl group not having any hydrogens whatsoever. So normal oxidation here was not going to be possible. Well, we're going to find out the same thing is true on the benzylic carbon here. So it's all focusing on the benzylic carbon here. And when your benzylic carbon is a quaternary carbon, no oxidation is going to take place there whatsoever. So in similar fashion, the way we saw that tertiary alcohols were not oxidizable by chromic acid, same thing here on the benzylic carbon. All right, so if we look at our different side chains here, so here we have a chance of oxidizing any carbon side chain in principle. So, but again, if your benzylic carbon is quaternary, no reaction is gonna take place there. So our benzylic carbon is uh, on this quaternary one, not oxidized at all. Now, if we look at the methyl carbon over here, so in this case, it is gonna get oxidized all the way to a carboxylic acid. So, and what's unique then, when you've got, uh, you know, a bigger carbon chain and stuff like that, the big key is that your benzylic carbon just to have, has to have at least one hydrogen for this to take place. Well, it turns out you're going to end up cleaving all carbon-carbon bonds. So from that benzylic carbon, except the one to the benzene ring. And so even though this has two carbons, you know, coming off the benzene, only one of them remains in the product. And so, and that one that remains gets oxidized all the way to a carboxylic acid as well. So, and again, mechanism is not so important here. I've never seen students on the hook for the mechanism here, but just like it was with alcohols, the mechanism does involve a hydrogen on that benzylic carbon, just like it uh, did on the alpha carbon of an alcohol. And so as a result, if you don't have that hydrogen, that's why the reaction can't take place. And so in this case, we ended up with two carboxylic acids, both getting oxidized. In one of them, we cleaved off one of the additional carbons that was attached to the benzylic carbon. So, but again, on our quaternary benzylic carbon, no reaction. So the next reaction we're going to cover here is actually review. So back from either the end of first semester or beginning of second semester, depending on your course. So but back with the free radical halogenation. So and that's the benzylic bromination here with n-bromosuccinamide. So here 
Uh, your most stable radical intermediate is on that benzylic carbon. It'll be resonant stabilized. We learned that uh, you know we're often using NBS and light or NBS and heat or NBS and peroxide uh, to either brominate allylically or in this case benzylically relevance to this chapter. And so in this case, this is a substitution reaction and we are gonna replace one of the hydrogens on the benzylic carbon with a bromine. And so the reason this is important is because bromine's a good leaving group. And now I've got a lot of other options of what I might do here. So, you know, because I've got a good leaving group here, all those normal reactions we talked about back in first semester, SN1, and I put SN2 there, I really wanted to put SN1 slash E1 is possible. So, but you might also do, let's make sure I did this the same order on your handout. So SN2, you might also do E2. So all of these are on the table. And so, you know, SN1 and E1, again, are not as likely from a synthesis perspective. So I'm going to kind of focus more on the SN2 and E2, but I can't rule it out completely. So, but SN2 and E2 more likely. And so if I, you know, want to do something with SN2, well, then ultimately, I'm going to replace that leaving group with some form of nucleophile. And if this thing is chiral, like just the wedge or just the dash, uh, you know, you get the other. Well, if we made it here and formed a chiral center, you'd get both the wedge and the dash. You'd get a racemic mixture. And so uh, as a result, doing backside attack would also get you the racemic mixture here as well. So, but if we do E2 elimination, So then we're going to form an alkene here. And what's nice about having an alkene is then you've got a whole host of alkene addition reactions that are possible to go from there. So super helpful from a synthesis perspective. Cool. But like I said, this is not a new reaction. This is totally review from the free radical halogenation chapter. So now we're going to take a look at side chain reductions. And the first two reductions we'll look at are called the Clemenson reduction and the wolf kishner reduction. And initially, they're going to appear very interchangeable. In most cases, they are. So, But every once in a while, a professor will actually make a point of emphasis of when you need to use one versus the other. Because one's going to be carried out under acidic conditions, and one's going to be carried out under basic conditions. And that makes a pretty profound difference in a couple of key places. And so we'll cover these generically, and then we'll talk about a couple of key places where it really does make a difference. Okay, so the Clemenson reduction is the reduction of a ketone or aldehyde specifically all the way to an alkane. So complete deoxygenation, we say. And so going from a ketone here to an alkane. Again, this works with any ketone or any aldehyde. So we'll see the relevance in this chapter is that in, you know, the result of a Friedel-Crafts acylation is going to be a ketone or aldehyde right on that benzylic carbon. Well, it doesn't actually have to be on the benzylic carbon. This could happen with an aliphatic ketone or aldehyde as well, and it's still going to reduce it all the way to an alkane. So, but special relevance in this chapter, as we'll see. So in the Clemenson reduction, we use a zinc amalgam, and amalgam means it's, uh, you know, got some mercury mixed with it. Uh, so a zinc amalgam, which is a combination of zinc and mercury, along with aqueous hydrochloric acid. So that's our reagents here. So, and again, it's acidic. Now in the Wolf-Kishner reduction, so we use what's called hydrazine here. And hydrazine, so H2N and H2, is also sometimes simply written as N2H4. So you should be prepared to see it either way. So, but under highly basic conditions with potassium hydroxide and heat. Now, the mechanism for this one is one we might actually study later on, but we're not gonna study it in this chapter. We'll probably study it in the ketone and aldehyde chapter. Some of you maybe are gonna see it here. So look ahead. I will cover this in the ketone and aldehyde chapter because um, there's some key reactions we need to learn before we can kind of incorporate uh, the mechanism here. And on the Clemenson reduction, don't worry about the mechanism. Most of you aren't going to be on the hook for it in any way, shape, or form. All right, so, but this is going to do exactly the same thing. So, complete deoxygenation, reduction all the way down to an alkane. And so, again, this is important. So, from a synthesis standpoint, because there are certain things we can't make in a Friedel Crafts alkylation, as you might recall. We said one of the drawbacks or one of the problems with the Friedel Crafts alkylation is carbocation rearrangements. And, and in this case, this lovely species is eventually going to form this lovely carbocation, which then rearranges to give this guy. And so as a result, the rearranged product or the rearranged intermediate, I should say, leads to the major product, which is this guy. Whereas if my goal had really been the unrearranged product, it ends up being just a minor product. And so that was one of the, the shortcomings of the Friedel Crafts alkylation. So, whereas with the Friedel Crafts acylation, we didn't ever have to worry about rearrangements. We had that very stable acylium ion as the intermediate that was resonant stabilized. And so I said very stable, very stable for a carbocation. 
So in this case though, we can get around this and we can make this as a major product by doing a Friedel Crafts acylation followed by one of our brand new reduction reactions. And so in this case, I use the appropriate uh, acyl halide along with AlCl3. So, and we'll get our Friedel Crafts isolation here. The results is a ketone. And now I can do either one, the Clemenson reduction or the Wolf Kirchner. I'll just choose the Clemenson at random. And in this case, now make this as our major product. So again, had some trouble getting that as a major product with just the same, uh, a simple Friedel Crafts alkylation due to carbocatomy arrangements, but I can do it with an acylation followed by either, again, the Clemenson or Wolf Kishner reduction. All right, so I want to take a look at an example here where it would make a difference if you did the Clemenson versus the Wolf Kishner. And that's if you have an alkene somewhere present in your molecule, because alkenes are subject to alkene addition reactions. And you might recall that if we use HCl, HBr, HI, we can add an H and a halogen across the alkene in Markovnikov addition. And so that's a problem. And so we're going to get not only reaction and reduction of the ketone with this top reagent, we're also going to get addition across that alkene there at the same time. So there's reduction of the ketone. So, but we're now going to add an H to the less substitute side and a chlorine to the more substitute side across the alkene. And that's going to happen at the same time. Now, if we did this with the Wolf Kishner, we don't have that problem. We don't have a hydrohalic acid here at all. In fact, we're under basic conditions. And so my alkene is just going to stay an alkene. And so if you've got, in addition to your benzene, or in addition, I really should say to your ketone, you don't actually have to have benzene, but in addition to your ketone or aldehyde, you've got an alkene or an alkyne, the Clemenson reduction is also going to result in addition across the alkenes and alkynes as well, whereas the wolf kishner is not. So I want to take a look at one more reaction where, uh, again, there'd be a difference between the Clemenson and the wolf kishner reduction. And so that's if you've got a halide present here, an alkyl halide somewhere. So with an alkyl halide, those are subject to being able to do SN2 and E2. And with the wolf kishner you're using potassium hydroxide, both a strong base, which makes E2 uh, an option, and also a strong nucleophile, which makes SN2 an option. So, well, in this particular reaction, I've got a primary halide, and it's not only primary, it's actually primary and benzylic, which actually activates it towards SN2 even more. So, but it turns out E2 is not even possible possible because the adjacent carbon doesn't have any hydrogens. And so SN2 is on the table, but in certain cases with your alkyl halide, you might be doing SN2, you might be doing E2, it all really depends. So, but with an alkyl halide, you're going to have an extra reaction with that wolf kishner And so it's still going to reduce the ketone in this case to an alkane, but now it's also going to lead to SN2 substitution of the bromine with that strong nucleophile, the hydroxide. So whereas if we do this with the Clemenson reduction, we don't have a strong nucleophile present in our solution now. And so in addition to reducing the ketone, it's not actually going to react with the alkyl halide. And so in this case, if your goal was only to have reduced the ketone, but not to have touched the alkyl halide, well, then you should have used the Clemenson rather than the Wolf Kishner. Cool. And like I said, a lot of you are going to be just looking at the, the Clemenson reduction and the Wolf Kishner reduction as being completely interchangeable. So, but some of you, your professor will make a point of you knowing when it's necessary to distinguish between the two. So now I want to take a quick look at nitro reduction and we can put a nitro group on our benzene with an EAS nitration reaction. So it turns out in this case, we can reduce it to an amine and one way to pull that off here. So is just catalytic hydrogenation. And it reduces it to an amine. And so this could have some, you know, relevance from a synthesis perspective and hence that we'll bring it up here. Now, it turns out though, we've learned that H2PDC does a ton of things, right? It not only can reduce a nitro group, it can reduce alkenes and alkynes. And so in this case, we're going to call this general reduction. So if we use catalytic hydrogenation, just it's going to reduce a whole variety of things. And so in this case, our alkene gets reduced to an alkane. So it turns out it can also reduce ketones and aldehydes as well. So in this case, 
Again, our NO2 group becomes an amine. So, but in this case, this one's going to be special. And some of you will learn this and some of you won't. So, but it turns out normally we think of H2PDC or H2 and nickel or something like that as reducing a ketone or aldehyde to an alcohol. But it turns out if it happens on the benzylic carbon, then actually it completely deoxygenates it and is functionally equivalent to what we see with either the Clemenson or Wolf Kishner reductions. So, some of you will have seen this, some of you won't. I just want to cover it super quick pay reference to it. So, but we're going to call this general reduction because a whole host of different groups can get reduced with catalytic hydrogenation. So now we want to talk about specific reduction of the nitro group. And so specific reduction of that nitro group, again, to an amine. So it can happen here. So you got one of three lovely metals you can use, zinc, iron, or tin uh, with acid and usually HCl, but it technically doesn't have to say HCl, it could say H plus, you know, generic or something like that. Uh, and then we've got to neutralize it. And the, the reason we've got to neutralize it here is that when we form this amine, it forms under acidic conditions. And so when it forms, it actually gets protonated. And so you've got to deprotonate it. And so we're just going to add just enough hydroxide to neutralize it. And so you might see, you know, instead of writing hydroxide, they might just write neutralize instead, or they might do both like I've done here or something like that. So, but that's the necessity of hydroxide here. We just got to deprotonate it, turning it back into its conjugate base, the amine here. So if we take a look at this middle one, for instance, then, So this is special reduction here now, specific to the nitro group, because if we use it here, so, and here I'm just gonna use the iron. Write it like so. We're gonna reduce only that nitro group. The alkene here is not gonna get touched, but our nitro group will indeed become an amine. And so with this method over here, it is specific to the nitro group, but you don't have to worry about it touching your alkene or anything of that sort with our generic catalytic hydrogenation reduction. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for EAS, uh, an aromatic compound practice problems, if you are looking for a final exam rapid review or practice final exams, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.